This is an audio sermon recorded at the Church of Christ at Johnson Mill in Fayetteville, Arkansas. We are Christians seeking to worship God in spirit and in truth according to the New Testament. Come worship with us Sunday mornings at 1030 at 3801 Johnson Mill Boulevard. The opening scripture on the front side right under the title Deuteronomy 29, 29. The Bible says the secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children that we may do all the words of this law. There are secret things that belong to God that maybe we wonder about, questions that we we ask, and and there's just no answer because they're not revealed to us in Scripture. I was doing a Bible study one time, and a couple asked me if Adam had a belly button. I don't know if Adam had a belly button. The Bible don't mention his belly button. Uh, I don't know if Eve had a belly button. She came out of Adam. I don't know. There are secret things that belong to the Lord our God. And so he didn't, evidently, Adam's belly button wasn't very important to God. That we know that, that we have that information. But the writer says here that those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children. And so whatever's in Scripture is revealed. It's for us. It's it's for our benefit. And, And so we should go to the Scriptures then. One of the great questions that's always plagued man since the beginning of time what happens after death? Five minutes after you're dead or I'm dead, what's happening with us? Where are we? Where's our soul? Men have always wondered about things like this, and we don't know a whole lot about what happens after death except Jesus in a story kind of pulled the curtain aside a little bit to give us a glimpse into the life beyond this one. And we know just a little bit about what happens immediately after we die. Five minutes after we die, we've got to be somewhere. Our soul will be somewhere. We will be conscious. We will know things around us. What will be going on? We'll study that today in the story that Jesus gave because in this story in Luke 16, the Lord tells this story to give us just a little bit of an idea of what we can expect after after death occurs. Turn to the inside with me and there you'll find the text of this scripture. Luke 16 verse 19 through 31 typed out for you there. And let's read that together. Jesus said there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, But if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. One of the first questions, folks, that arises when you read this story is this. Is this a historical account of two men that literally lived here on the earth, and therefore true? Or is it just a parable? I don't know how many times I've been asked that. Is this a parable, or is it historically true? Did it literally happen? And my answer to them usually is it doesn't make any difference. If it's a historical record of two men that lived here on earth, and I believe it is, then of course the story is true and what happened to them is true. But it's no less true if it's a parable. Jesus used a lot of parables in His teaching. This word parable means placing beside. And the Lord would would tell a story and He'd take the events and characters in that story and then place them beside other truths that He wanted to teach. But when the Lord told parables and used parables in His teaching, He never made up things. He never told lies in order to teach truths. All of His parables were true to life. 
They happened, in other words. For example, when he taught on the kingdom, Jesus would say the kingdom is likened to a net let down into the sea and gathered of fishes. That happened all the time. He'd say the kingdom is likened to a woman which had put leaven in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. That happened all the time as the women of Palestine made their bread. He took true to life situations. Never did he tell a whopper. Never did he make up a tale in order to illustrate the truth that he was teaching. And so if this is just a parable, it's still true because he's taking a true situation and using it to illustrate truth. The Lord is not, uh, is not uh, lying to us, is not leading us on. He's telling us in this story what we can expect to happen after death. And it makes no difference if it's a parable or, or if it's historical truth. So let's just study the story and, and, and look at the, the characters in it and such things. And there's a lot of things to be gained from this study today. I'm going to take a little time this morning. I'm going to ask you for time to be patient with me. And, and we're going to dig as deep into this story as we can go as time permits. The first character that we're introduced to in the story is a certain rich man. And we're not told his name. You know, usually if we know somebody wealthy, we like to brag about knowing them. We like to mention their name. Jesus never mentioned this guy's name. We don't know his name. There's a lot of things about him. We just know he was dressed in purple and fine linen, that he fared sumptuously every day. He had income just rolling into him daily. And this man was very wealthy. I do not know how he got his wealth. We have a lot of people in this country that think if you're rich, you're dishonest. And they want us to have class envy, and they want us to, to be jealous of those that have made a lot of money. Now listen, I know sometimes that, that people make a lot of money, and they do it in ill-gotten ways. They do it wrongly and improperly. But there are people that are wealthy, and they made their money honestly. And we need to judge every person by their character and by their circumstance. Not all wealthy people are dishonest, any more than not all poor people are honest. Some of the most dishonest people I know in the world are as poor as a church mouse, and they'd, they'd take the shirt off your back. They'd steal you blind if they could. Everybody deserves to be judged in, in individually, as Martin Luther King said, by their character, by the content of character. There's nothing to indicate that this man obtained his wealth in an improper manner, not at all. And, you know, people make money in different ways. Some people marry money. They do. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, Let's take the Walton family. Somebody had to marry those kids. Now, whoever married those kids got wealthy, didn't they? I mean, pretty quick. But I mean, hey, the Walton kids deserve a mate, don't they? Somebody's got to marry them. And when they did, they got rich. There wasn't anything wrong with that. Now they've got money. They didn't do anything dishonest. Some people inherit money. You know, when Sam Walton died, somebody had to get his money. What's he supposed to do, burn it where nobody will get it? Somebody got the money. They didn't do anything dishonest to get that money. They're just rich because they're connected to him and they're one of his heirs. And some people make money that way. There's nothing wrong with that. We shouldn't be jealous of those people. That was their lot in life. That's what fell to them. There's so many things that we don't pick in life. We don't pick our family who we're born to. We don't, we don't pick our skin color. We don't pick our height. We don't pick how handsome or, or how ugly we are or how beautiful or ugly or whatever. Our size, so many times, is, is not determined by us. There's just so many things we don't choose. And uh, so we should, not, we should not be jealous over people that have accumulated things like this. You know, some people make money the old-fashioned way. They, they roll up the sleeves and they work hard and earn it. And God bless them. That, I mean, this is America. That's what it's about. And if you want to apply yourself and get educated and and develop some skills and talents and abilities, you can make a lot of money in this country because there's opportunities for it. And that's wonderful that we live in this good land. But there's no indications in this story that this man became wealthy in a dishonest way, and that's what I want you to see. Every indication is that he got it honestly. Let's give him the benefit of the doubt. But when you and I make our money and, and we obtain wealth honestly, we have not discharged our whole duty regarding money we have a related obligation to use it properly. And that's where the man failed. You see, there are three parties that are involved in obtaining wealth. First and foremost, there's God. And without God, you and I wouldn't have anything. We wouldn't be here, would we? God created us. Any skills and abilities and talents we have came from God. 
If you're a great cabinet builder or a skilled carpenter, God gave you that ability. If you're very talented musically or have a great voice, you got that from God. We can't even brag about that. If you've got a good memory and a good mind, you got that from God. Any skills and talents that you and I may have were given to us. And any wealth that we accumulated, if you'll think about your house and car, all your clothes, your possessions, any money that you might have in the bank, think of anything that you've accumulated. Ultimately, first and foremost, God is responsible for that. Amen. On the back side, Deuteronomy 8, verse 18, read with me. The Bible says, Thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is He that giveth thee power to get wealth. There it is. God gives you power to get wealth. James 1 and 17, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So God then is the source of every good and every perfect gift. Without God we wouldn't have anything. Secondly, all that you have in this life you've obtained because of other people. Do you realize you've got to have other people to make money? We have an economy that's based upon an exchange of goods and services. We've got to mingle with people. Chris is a construction fellow. He's, he makes his money in construction. If people don't need houses repaired, Chris can't make money. Julie works for a company. If that company doesn't need uh, service, if it doesn't mingle with people and they don't need its services, she has no money. David sells real estate. If there's nobody to buy houses, he makes no money. We cannot make money without other people. You know, you can put a man out on a deserted island like Robinson Crusoe, he can't make a dime out there because he can't mingle with people and exchange goods and services. And so it takes other people for you and I to obtain whatever we have. Let's remember that. We may have been industrious and all, but others helped us, and so did God. The third party involved is ourselves. You know, uh, God can give us power to get wealth, and our fellow man can give us opportunity. We've got to get up off our behind. And we've got to apply ourselves mentally and physically and, and work. And a lot of people today are poor because they are able bodied and can work, but they will not. Some will not train themselves sufficiently to get a decent job that would provide a little better living, see. They have a responsibility in that. And there are people that are dirt poor because it's their choosing. Now other people can't help it. They've got illness, circumstances in life that have put them in very dire circumstances, and these are people that need our compassion. These are the people we need to help, and we need to be concerned about them. But we also need to be people that are industrious, and the Bible teaches us to work and to provide for ourselves and for our family. Three parties are involved in obtaining wealth, God, our fellow man, and us. And if that's the case, when we get ready to spend our money, shouldn't we consider all three of these? Amen. If you had three men that were partners in a business and they made a good profit during the year and one of the men took all the money for himself and didn't share with the other two that helped him make it, you'd call him a crook. If God has helped us obtain what we have, if other people have helped us, when we give, shouldn't we remember God first? Shouldn't we remember our fellow man and when we find others that are down on their luck that need a helping hand and God has blessed us abundantly, shouldn't we open up generously and give to them and help their needs? Sure we should. And this is where the man in the story failed. It's not that he made his money wrong. He didn't use it properly. He was covetous. And folks, listen, a person can be lost for sure because they're dishonest, but we can be lost because we're stingy. And I want this church to remember that. We can be lost because we're covetous and stingy. We don't ever want to be that way. This was his problem. The second character we're introduced to the, in the story is a, is a beggar. Did you notice Jesus gave his name? He, uh, he mentioned the name of the poor man, but he never mentioned the name of the rich. This man's name is Lazarus. That word Lazarus means God is my help or whom God helps. God's my helper. And that tells you a little bit about his life, ultimately the secret of his life. God was his helper, and yet when you look at him, he's in pretty dire circumstances. He's in a, a bleak situation, isn't he? First of all, let's look at the man. He's helpless. 
Jesus said that they laid him daily at the rich man's gate. That implies to me he could not get there on his own. Somebody carried him. He's helpless. Can't walk. Can't get around. Number two, he's afflicted. The Lord said he was full of sores. So I take it from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. This man is covered in sores. And that may explain why he can't walk. Maybe he can't take the pressure put on those sores. We're not told. It may be difficult for him to recline or lie down or, or even sit because sores are covering him everywhere. And he, as he puts pressure on them, it, it's agony. So he's in a horrible, afflicted condition. He can't afford medical care even if it's available. Number three, he is, he's not merely poor, he is a beggar. How many of you have ever begged for a meal? Just literally begged for the next meal. Now you may have, I never have. We grew up uh, with not a lot of money. Let me tell you a little bit about it. Dad made 66 cents an hour when I was a kid. Now you're wondering how in the world did he feed a family on 66 cents an hour? If he worked a 10 hour day, folks, that's $6.60 a day. We lived on this. Now that was before taxes, of course. We had a cow, so we had beef. We had milk. We had chickens, and so we had eggs. We had uh, a garden, and we grew a big garden, and mom canned, and I mean canned and canned and canned. All year round we had fresh vegetables, canned vegetables. And Dad kept us fed, and I never did have to beg for a meal. Never once in my life. Now we didn't have anything. We had no running water in the house. Some of you younger people can't even imagine how some of us a little older grew up, but we had no we had no indoor bathroom, and so we had the old outdoor John that you hear about or see one occasionally. That's a lot of fun. <clears throat> uh, it's a lot of fun, if you never have tried it, to bathe in the number three wash tub, a galvanized tub. You set it in the kitchen floor, and we turned the oven on, had a gas stove, turned the oven on, opened the door. There wasn't any heating stove in the kitchen, just the stove, the cook stove. And you took your bath dead of winter right there in front of the stove, the problem was if uh, somebody bathed before you, you bathed in their water. I had to bathe sometimes in my brother Joe's water, old dingy gray water, you know, soapy water. And so it was really nice to be the first one to bathe because you didn't want to go to the well if it was five degrees outside and draw water and bring it in and then eat it on the stove and pour it in your galvanized tub. It was a different way of life. We just had no running water. That's just the way it was. When I was 10 years old, we finally got it. Dad, uh, Mom died, Dad remarried, and I guess Dad wanted to impress the new wife. I don't know, but, but he, got, uh, he got my stepmother some, some running water finally. And life, life got a little better. But you know what? I never begged for a meal. Never had to beg. Didn't know what it was to be hungry. This man was hungry. More than that, look at what he begged for, just crumbs that would fall from the rich man's table. He didn't ask for a hot meal up there at the mansion, just ordinarily what would, would fall off the table onto the floor that the dogs would get. That's exactly what he asked for. He's very modest about it. And yet in spite of his situation, now he's helpless and afflicted and a beggar and he's, he's hungry, he still served God. We don't hear him complaining to God, why have you let me get this way, God? He's like uh, Joseph when he was down in Egypt as a slave. He served God. Like Daniel who was in captivity in Babylon, he served God when, when the situation was difficult. The rich man, on the other hand, failed to serve God under favorable conditions. I mean, he had wealth and the finest of everything in life, and yet he didn't serve God, see. But it's to the credit of this beggar that he did serve God. And notice, too, he was very modest in his desires, he just asked for the crumbs that fell off the rich man's table. He didn't ask him for lodging. He didn't ask him if he'd come up and have a room in the mansion. He didn't ask him to put him on a monthly pension where he'd have money coming in every month from welfare. He did not ask him for a hot meal at the table, just the treatment ordinarily given to dogs, just the crumbs that fell off the rich man's table. That's what he asked for. Jesus said that dogs came by and licked this man's sores. We know when a dog licks you, it's not to show hostility or anger. It's usually out of affection and loyalty. The dogs treated this man better than the rich man did. 
And then we notice, if you're reading verse 22 there with me, Luke 16, 22, this beggar finally died. Jesus said it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. I don't know how he died. I wish we knew. Did he die of his afflictions? Maybe. Exposure to the elements, possibly. Hunger? Maybe. Or was it a combination of these? It could have been. We don't know how he died. I wonder as I read about his death, did he die alone? Did he have to die alone? Was there a doctor? Was there a physician present? Was there a nurse? Was there a relative? Because when our loved ones die, we, we like to keep what we call the death watch, if we can, if they're suffering and lingering. We sit with them. When my father died, Julie and I were both in, in the room with him. When, when Dad took his last breath, we saw it. We saw him die. My, my mother died about a year ago, just about a year ago. And uh, I sat with her all that night. I watched her draw the last breath. We, we keep the death watch with them. We, we will wet a washcloth and we'll, we'll dampen it and, and we'll put water on their lips and try to keep their lips moist or we'll adjust their pillow or we'll try to do something to make their last moments as comfortable as possible. But I wonder when this man died if he had any of that kind of treatment. I doubt it. But there was somebody watching. And that was his heavenly father. That was God. And when it came time for this beggar to die, God sent angels to carry his soul out of that diseased body and over across the way to a place that Jesus called Abraham's bosom. And so you see, sometimes it doesn't matter if the dogs lick us in this life. It does matter if the angels serve us in death. And God sent the angels. He never forgets his own people. And they took the soul of this poor beggar because he served God, took him to a place of comfort and rest. Next, we learn that the rich man died. There's just some things that, that money will not buy, and he died. And, you know, Hebrews 9 and 27 says, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So death treads through the mansion of the rich just like it comes through the shack of the poor man. Death is no respecter of persons. And so this man died. And uh, I want you to notice that he not only died, he was buried. Now we don't know what happened to the beggar's body. We weren't told. We were told it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. Nothing said about his body because the emphasis in the beggar's life has been on his soul and that's where it is in death. But now when the rich man dies, did you notice we're told about his body? He was buried. I want you to keep that in mind. Notice he was buried. Buried. Uh, we know what happened to his body. That's where his emphasis was. You see, he was dressed in purple and fine linen. He fared sumptuously every day. His table was running over with food. When he dies, there's emphasis on his body. I imagine this guy had a big funeral, don't you? A lot of times the wealthy do. He probably had a lot of servants on earth and Maybe there were great lines of mourners when he died. Might have been the biggest funeral ever seen in that community. Who knows? But I also wonder something else. Where's the angels? Look at verse 22. It came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Where's the angels? I'm not saying angels didn't come but they're not mentioned, are they? They're just not mentioned. Immediately after the rich man died, where is he? What happens to him and what happens to the beggar? That's what I want to talk about a little while. Let's read there on the back, Luke 16. Let's read verse 23 through 26. Remember we were told in 22, the rich man also died and was buried. 23, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments. This is immediately after death. In hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, 
Remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Let's look at this for just a moment. Verse 23, the Bible says of the rich man after he died that in hell he lift up his eyes being in torments. What do you think about when you think of the word hell? When you read that word in your Bible, don't you think of the lake of fire? Generally we do. The problem is though that this word here, hell, is not really the Greek word that, that refers to the lake of fire. It's another Greek word. And the translators of the King James, and I love the King James Version, we're using it this morning. But there are three different Greek words in the New Testament, and when they translated those words uh, in, in, their, in their version here, they used our English word hell. And it's confusing because we think of the lake of fire when we think of hell, don't we? Turn on the inside with me. There's a diagram here. And I have those three Greek words listed for you. I also have the word definitions from Strong's and in some cases Thayer. And uh, let's, let's read these definitions and look at these three words and we'll notice where they're at on the chart and the diagram down below. The first word is tartaro. There it is, T-A-R-T-A-R-O-O. -O. It's Strong's word number 5020 if you have a strong concordance. And Strong says that it means the deepest abyss of Hades. It's the name of the subterranean region, doleful and dark, regarded by the ancient Greeks as the abode of the wicked dead, where they suffer punishment for their evil deeds. That's Strong's definition out of their dictionary. This word Tartaru is found one time in your New Testament. That's it. It's just found once in Scripture. And that's in 2 Peter 2 and 4. And there it is right below. And let's read that verse. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. That word hell that's in the red there is the Greek word tartaru. This is the only verse where that word's found. And, and we learn here it's the abode of wicked angels. If God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell. Look at the diagram now with me. These angels in heaven that sinned that God threw out of heaven, when He cast them down, He sent them down to Tartaru, and Tartaru is the deepest pit in Hades. Now picture this whole circle in the middle here as Hades, all of it. It has a section of comfort called Abraham's bosom where God's people are, where the beggar went. It has a place of torment, and those two are separated by a great gulf or an expanse that can't be crossed. But in the deepest pit of it, the deepest regions of Hades, Tartaru is the abode of these wicked angels. And they've been there for centuries probably. And they'll be there till Jesus comes. And then He'll take them and cast them over here into the lake of fire. And this is the Greek word Gehenna. But this word in Luke 16, 23 is not Tartaru or Gehenna. Tartaru is one of those three words. And the, the translators... They should have just said Tartaru. If God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to Tartaru. But they translated it hell. And when we read it, we think, well, he's in the lake of fire. No, he's not. He's in the deepest pit in Hades. See? And uh, that, that's the abode of the wicked angels. That's all we know about this place. See? The second word there in the middle, Gehenna. Now, this is the lake of fire. <clears throat> this is Strong's Word 1067. It's found 12 times in your New Testament. In the King James, it's translated hell nine times and hell fire three times. And Strong says that hell is the place of future punishment called Gehenna or Gehenna of fire. It's the place, in other words, of everlasting punishment. This is hell fire. But when a person goes to Gehenna to hell fire, they go their soul and body. Look, at, look down below Matthew 10:28. This is where the word is used here, Gehenna. Jesus said, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear Him, that's God, who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And that word hell there is Gehenna. 
And notice Jesus said that when you go to Gehenna, this hell here, you go soul and body. Was the rich man in his body or was he buried? He was buried, wasn't he? So wherever he went, he wasn't in his body. It was just his soul. See, his, the rich man died and was buried, so we know he was out of his body, see. But if he had gone to the lake of fire, he would have been there in his body because we go there soul and body. And he wasn't in his body. And that's how we know that he's not in the lake of fire. He's not in Gehenna. And besides, that's not the word in Luke 16, 23. This is the lake of fire. And this is the final place of punishment. It is Gehenna. And that's the word there in Matthew 10, 28, translated hell. Uh, the word hell in Luke 6, uh, in uh, 2 Peter 2, 4 is Tartaru. It's a different word, see. Tartaru, the deepest pit in Hades, where the wicked angels are. Gehenna, the lake of fire, where people go soul and body. It's the final place of punishment for the wicked. Now there's one other Greek word that's translated hell, and that's the one used in Luke 16. And that's Hades. Look at the third word here on the right, on your chart. Hades, Strong's word number 86. <clears throat> this word's used 11 times in your New Testament. 11 times. In the King James, it's translated hell 10 times and grave one time, and that word grave is a mistranslation. It ought to be, it ought to really be translated Hades every time it's found. The translator should have just said of the rich man in Luke 16, 23, after he died, and in Hades he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. But they translated it hell. And so we get to thinking, well, that's hell fire. Hades is this whole region right here, this, this middle circle. It has a place of comfort, Abraham's bosom. It has a place of torment where the wicked are, where the rich man went. It has a great gulf or an expanse that separates these two places. And the deepest pit of it is Tartaru, where the wicked angels are held prisoner right now until Jesus returns. Hades. In Hades he lift up his eyes, being in torments. That's the word. See it down there at the bottom in Luke 16, 23. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments. And that word hell there is Hades. It is the abode of the soul. And that's all Hades is. The Jews believe that Hades is in the heart of the earth. And that when we die, angels come and they carry us down into this entrance below. The righteous are taken to the right and taken over to a place of comfort called Abraham's bosom. And the wicked are taken over to the left to a place of torment that's in the neighborhood of hellfire itself. And uh, there they abide in torment. This is where the soul goes at the death of the body. When a person dies, five minutes later you're in Hades. Hades is not a bad place. It's got a it's got a good place. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But it also has a place of torment. Now when Jesus died, Jesus went to Hades. I'm not just going to assert that this morning. I'm going to prove it out of the Bible. When Jesus died, His soul went to Hades. When the Lord died, He commended His spirit to God the Father, didn't He? Father, into Thy hands I commend my spirit. That's Luke 23, 46. Where was the Lord's body for three days? It was in a tomb. Where was His soul? Hades. Now let me prove that to you. And uh, let's read some scripture here from our outline. <clears throat> Be on the back side. Let's read uh, Luke 23, verse 39 to 43 there on the back. Luke, Luke 23, verse 39 to 43. You'll remember this story. The Bible says, One of the male factors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Does not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man had done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. That's the old thief, isn't it? thief on the cross. And Jesus forgave that thief, and He tells the man, Today you're going to be with Me in paradise. Now wherever Jesus went that day when He died on the cross, the thief went with Him. He said, Today you'll be with Me in paradise. Normally paradise refers to heaven. Many times in Scripture it does. In this case it refers to Abraham's bosom, 
this place of comfort in Hades. How do I know that? Because that's where Jesus went. And now let me prove that to you. He took the thief to that very place the day He died. John 20 and verse 17, if you'll remember the Lord's resurrection, you'll remember that uh, Mary Magdalene, one of the women, was, the, was the, one of the first at the tomb that morning. She had come to see if they could remove that heavy stone and they were going to anoint the body of Jesus because He was buried in haste on the Friday before. And it was on a Sunday morning. And when she gets there, the stone's rolled away and the tomb's empty and the body's missing and she don't know where Jesus is. Finally, she opens her eyes. She runs into a fellow in the garden. It, he's dressed in white. He looks like the gardener. That's who she thought he was. This is the gardener. And she asked him, where have you taken my Lord? You know, he's, he's, he's gone. And uh, finally, her eyes were open and she saw it was Jesus. What did she do, first thing? Let me ask you something. If one of your loved ones right now came back and appeared to you, Julie, if it were a grandmother, whoever it might be special, what's the first thing you'd want to do? You'd want to touch them, maybe hug them. You'd reach for them. She must have reached for Jesus. John 20, 17, read it. Christ said, <coughs> excuse me, touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and unto my God and your God. Jesus said, Don't touch me, Mary. I haven't ascended to my Father. Where's He been? Well, His spirit returned to God, all right, and His body's been in the tomb, but where's His soul been? Hades. Hades. And now I'll prove that to you from Acts chapter 2. If you'll read with me there on the back from verse 25 through 32. Acts 2 is the day of Pentecost. It's 50 days after the Lord's death. Uh, Peter's preaching the gospel there in Jerusalem for the first time after Jesus died and rose. And he's preaching the resurrection of Jesus. And to do that, he quotes David out of one of the Psalms. David in Psalm 16, if you're taking notes, verse 8 to 11 said these words that Peter quotes here in Acts 2, verse 25 and following. So he's quoting Psalm 16, 8 to 11. And here's what, what he says about David. For David speaketh concerning him, Christ, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he was on my right, he was on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known unto me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Now that's the quote from Psalm 16, verse 8 to 11. David said, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. There's that word hell. Is that Gehenna? Is that Tartaru? Or is it Hades? It's Hades. And this is a prophecy about Jesus, that when He died, His soul would not be left in Hades, neither would His flesh see corruption. Now look at verse 29 as Peter begins to apply this passage to Jesus' resurrection. He says, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne, he, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, listen, that his soul was not left in hell, Hades, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof were all witnesses. Peter said David was talking about Christ that his soul would not be left in Hades and his flesh wouldn't see corruption. Now that's true, isn't it? Did the Lord's body ever see corruption? It never returned to dust, did it? It was only dead three days. God didn't allow his body to see corruption. He also didn't leave his soul in Hades. The third day, Jesus broke out of Hades. He conquered it. And his soul came out and came back to earth and reunited with his body there in the tomb, and the resurrection occurred, see. 
And the Lord came forth out of the tomb that day. He had taken that thief to paradise, to Abraham's bosom, to this place in Hades. Jesus Himself went there. As I said, this is not a bad place if you go to the right place there. See? Hades has a place of comfort for all of God's people. That's where they're at. And it has a place of torment for all the wicked of all ages, and that's where they're at. And that's where the rich man went. But Jesus went to that place of comfort. Now, so did the beggar. When he died, he was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. Let's look at Luke 16, verse 22 and 25, and we'll, we'll get an idea of this. <clears throat> we read there uh, where Abraham's really talking to him. We read that came to pass the beggar died, was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Look at verse 25. Abraham says, Son, this is to the rich man, Remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. This beggar was being comforted. Now listen, you cannot comfort what's not alive, can you? His soul exists, see. The beggar, when he died here on earth, his soul was carried across the way to Abraham's bosom, the place where Jesus went, where he took the thief. And there, as the rich man is down here in torment and looking across and seeing them, he's told by Abraham, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. Now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. See, This, this place in Hades, uh, Abraham's bosom, is a wonderful place. Here's what we know about it. All of God's children are there. Abel, Noah, can you imagine going to that place and seeing Noah? He's there. Abraham, Moses, David, all the prophets, John the Baptist, all the apostles, people that we've known and loved in this life that we've sat in assemblies with and worshiped with are over here right now if they've served the Lord in this place of comfort. There's a big crowd of people waiting over there. There's an old song we used to sing in a, in a hymnal. I will not be a stranger when I get to that city. I'm acquainted with folks over there. There'll be friends there to greet me. There'll be loved ones to meet me on the streets of that city so fair. Through the years, through the tears, they've, they've gone one by one, but they'll wait at the gate till my race is run. I will not be a stranger when I get to that city. I'm acquainted with folks over there. So this is a wonderful place where the, our soul will go to rest if we serve the Lord faithfully. We won't have to worry about death. Five minutes after we die, comfort. Better off than we ever were here. Now let's look at the fate of the other man, the rich man for a while, because he didn't experience that after death. And Jesus wants us to know what's waiting if we're not faithful. This man lifted up his eyes in torment, remember? Verse 22 to 24. It came to pass that the beggar died, was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, or Hades, he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I'm tormented in this flame. This man is conscious. See that? His body's dead, but he's still conscious because this is his soul. He can see. He looks across the way and sees Abraham and this beggar in his bosom. He can hear and he can speak. He's alive, isn't he? He can be tormented. You know what? You can't torment something that's dead. If you have a pet that dies, try tormenting it. You can stab it with an ice pick if you want to. You'll never hurt that pet. It's dead. You, you can't torment what's dead. But this man's in torment, and that shows you right there that he still exists, and that when we die, our soul lives on, see? And this man's in torment. He still has memory. Uh, Abraham will tell him, Son, remember. 
Remember that in thy lifetime thou receivest thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. If you wonder, will we have memory? Absolutely. Yeah. Abraham tells him, remember. Remember how you had it back on earth? You had your good things and Lazarus had evil things. See? So we still retain our memory. We're conscious. We can see, hear, speak. We have memory. We can be tormented. And uh, his plea for mercy can't be granted for two reasons. Number one, he's right where he should be in view of the way he lived. He's not tormented because he's rich. He's tormented because he didn't serve God. See, The beggar's not comforted because he was a beggar, but because he served God in spite of it. Verse 25, Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and thou art tormented. See, they've reversed roles. The rich man has become the beggar, begging for enough water on the tip of a finger to cool his tongue, and the beggars become the rich man. They've just reversed roles after death. Isn't that amazing? Verse 26, he said beside all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed. That word gulf just means expanse. Think of the Gulf of Mexico. It's an expanse of water that separates Florida and Cuba. This is a gulf of some kind. It's an expanse. Some people think it's a chasm, that it's a huge canyon. Worse, maybe wider even than what we'd call the Grand Canyon. It's just an, a, a, a region that cannot be crossed. A deep, deep crossing there. And uh, it separates these two regions one from another. And he says, uh, he says uh, that, that your, your request can't be granted. In your lifetime you had your good things, Lazarus evil things, he's comforted, you're tormented. Beside this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. He said, this can't be crossed. And so when you die, folks, that's it. There's no praying you out of purgatory. There's no getting you out of suffering. You can pay somebody to pray for you all you want. It will do no good. Abraham couldn't help this guy, and he's the father of the faithful. No priest is going to help you either. When you die, your destiny is fixed. And now the rich man realizes that, and I want you to notice verse 27 through 31 there on the back. His final request to Abraham. Because he begins to think about his family now back on earth. You know, people that die, if they've lived a wicked life, they're going to be worried about their loved ones. Worried that they'll be following them, see. And so verse 27, <clears throat> Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, talking about the beggar, send him back, that he may, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. He said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. He wants the beggar sent back to earth because he's got five brothers back here at his father's house. Life is still going on on earth. And he's left behind an influence that's going to curse and destroy his family, and he knows it. He doesn't want his five brothers to join him here. He doesn't want to be with them again because he knows if he's ever with them, they'll be in torment too, and he doesn't want them in torment. So he wants the beggar to return from the dead and Abraham to send him back to warn his five brothers. But Abraham tells him, your five brothers have Moses and the prophets. The law was still in effect then. And they had, they had Moses, the prophets. And he said, nay, Father, but if, if one went unto them from the dead, they'll repent. And he tells him, if they don't hear Moses and the prophets, they wouldn't be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Nobody is sent from the dead to warn us. Jesus rose from the dead. How many people believe in Christ? See, when we die, we're going to leave behind an influence. 
Uh, you may be saying to yourself, well, it's my own life and I'm living it and I'm not bothering anybody. Yes, you are. If you're not living for the Lord, your influence is against the Lord. You're influencing your family. You're influencing people at school or at work, in your neighborhood, your relatives. Somebody's watching you. And when you die, if you go to this place of torment that we've talked about, you may find that your relatives are going to be coming over to that place and that's going to worry you to death. This man doesn't even want to see his five brothers anymore. He doesn't want to be with them. Because he knows to be with them, they'll be with him in torment. And he loves them too much. The curtain falls on this scene. The beggar is in Abraham's bosom in comfort. Not because he's a beggar, but because he served God. The rich man is in torment immediately after death. Not because he's rich, but because he would not serve God. They each determine their destiny after death by how they lived here. So are we. Five minutes after we're dead, we're going to be in comfort or torment. <coughs> Where will it be? If you were to die right now, today, would you go to be with the beggar or would you go to be with the rich man? We hope you enjoyed this teaching from God's Word. To receive new sermons each week, subscribe on Google Play Music, iTunes, Spotify, and like us on Facebook. Thanks for listening, and God bless.